Welcome everybody to Games Now February 2021 session. I am super happy to be here with you again and explore another topical issue of uh, game development and game industry and games cultures. Uh, my name is Anna Kasa Kultima. I'm from Alto University, such as is also my beautiful co host, Solly Park. Solly, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you? <laughs> it's great. I, I don't know, like, when do we get out of the whole COVID situation, but I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty much getting used to the, the whole online life here. So it doesn't really change the things that we do, and we're just uh, happy to share the information that we have and collaborate with people and talking about the new topics of the game industry. Uh, but without further ado, everybody's waiting for our uh, uh, very esteemed guest, uh, the, the things on top of my head here. So uh, Mikko Merilainen from the University of, uh, from the Tampere University is here today talking with us. So Solip, would you introduce our guest of honor? Yes, of course. So today we will tackle some of the darker side of gaming culture and how to fix those problems through design or by taking actions ourselves. So our amazing speaker today is Mikko Merlainen, a postdoctoral research at the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies and Tampere University here in Finland. Uh, Mikko is also an active game expert in Finnish media, so some of our Finnish audiences may have seen Mikko's interview on news outlets. And today, Mikko will share some of his expertise in well-being problematic gaming, inclusivity, and corporate responsibility in the gaming industry. Okay, and without further ado, Mikko, the stage is yours. Hello, Mikko, how are you doing? Hello. Hey, pretty much fine, fine. Uh, lots of lots of Zoom discussions today, so I'm trying to avoid like resting Zoom face here. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you're not a thank cat. You. I'm, I'm not a cat. I'm, I'm prepared <laughs> to go forward with this. <laughs> Good. So yeah, let's let's give you the stage. Just uh, put your presentation on, and we are ready to hear what you have to say. Uh, for the viewers of the stream, make sure that you have your questions posted on the on the uh, chat, so we can pick them up at the end of the uh, this um, session. So go ahead, please. Yep. Thank you very much. So, as you can see, today's talk will be about building sustainable gaming cultures. Um, my contact details are there on the screen. You can con contact me by email, uh, check out my homepage in case you want to see something like publications or things like this. And you can, of course, follow me on Twitter at MV Merilainen uh, for a weird combination of social justice, pro wrestling, miniature gaming, science communications, and just general, general rubbish. <laughs> the things we post on Twitter. So uh, a few words about myself. At first, um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Tampere University, and as mentioned, I uh, work at the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies. Uh, my research focus is on youth gaming cultures, especially uh, people around the age of, of 12 to, to 30. So a quite broad definition of, of youth, of young people. I'm quite interested in questions of gaming and well-being. Uh, I made, did my dissertation on parenting young game players. So this is what I'm usually in the media uh, discussing. So basically tackling questions like how should parents uh, address gaming issues, for example. Uh, young people's gaming is obviously a very interesting subject to a lot of people, a very personal subject to a lot of people. So there is, there is always interest, I think. I've also been doing studies on game jam learning. Uh, game jamming is, is a really, really fun hobby, it's a really fun activity. Uh, and with my colleagues at the Growing Mind Research Project, we are looking at uh, how game jams can be used in general education to further learning. Uh, before I did research work, I was working in at the NGO EHUT, uh, the Finnish NGO for substance abuse prevention, but tackling young people's gaming and gambling risks and preventing those. Uh, this was, of course, very interesting for me because, why, as you can, uh, uh, as you can see from the next point, I have been an active game player since age five, so 33 years now. Um, and of course, going into into an uh, into something, uh, an employment in which I have to address 
the problematic aspects of of gaming then it, it wasn't it wasn't all that easy for me and this is something that will be tackled today in this in this presentation and as mentioned i'm a long time game player i uh, usually play on the on the pc and you may notice that I, there is the the word gamer in parentheses and this is again related to today's today's topic so as you may know the word gamer is pretty loaded these days some consider it to be a fairly neutral description of just someone who plays games or who identifies as a game player. But of course, with all these, uh, all the activities in recent years, of course, Gamergate being the most notable, then there are people who consciously avoid using the term gamer about themselves. Uh, I'm still on the fence. I don't quite know. Uh, I play games. I have games as a hobby, but I'm not sure whether I identify as a gamer. Uh, partly, partly due to the to all the sort of toxic baggage that the word carries, but also uh, in regard to what role gaming has in my life. So what we will be talking about today, or I will be talking about today, and what you will be listening hopefully to today, is first uh, a few words on gaming cultures and building. And you know, don't be don't be frightened by the by the italics, don't be frightened by the German. I will I will get around to that. Um, I will do my best to make things more complicated. Uh, I, I talk a lot to, to parents, for example, who are always looking for, for easy answers to parenting questions. And I feel that it's my job to make things more complicated, whether it's with parents or it's with media or, or whether I'm talking to students or professionals. We will explore some of the problems in gaming culture, some of the pressing, pressing issues currently. And I will be offering some solutions. There will be no patent solution. So if, if you are expecting some sort of uh, ready-made solution to all the tricky problems, all the wicked problems of gaming culture, then unfortunately you will be maybe slightly disappointed, but it's still worth listening. I'll try and make this as entertaining as possible. Today's topic is sustainable gaming cultures. And of course, there are a lot of different definitions for sustainability. Uh, we talk about sustainable development, for example, uh, sustainable ecologies, this kind of thing. The definition I'm using today for sustainable is that it's something to be upheld or defended. So what this means in the context of gaming cultures, it is something that we can that we can stand behind. It's something that we can support, something that we can be proud of, uh, something that will hopefully be lasting. It's built on a healthy foundation. These sorts of these sorts of ideas. If you are familiar with some of the problematic issues in gaming culture, then obviously those represent something that is not sustainable, even though it has been. Uh, existing for a long time, even it has been, if it has been uh, even accepted, then it might still not be sustainable. Uh, for example, uh, working working employees to burnout is is not sustainable, even though if in some places it can be the norm of game development. Just to pick one example. And of course, following with the definitions, we'll be talking about gaming cultures in plural. So there is no one single gaming culture. Uh, we have a lots and lots and lots of diverse gaming cultures. Uh, they are you know, combinations of, of platform, style of play, game, and game type. They're they are con contested, they're in flux, they are changing. Uh, my way of playing some kind of game is very different from someone else's way of playing the same game, not to mention playing the same game uh, or playing a different game or playing the same game on a different platform and so on and so on and so on. If you've had any contact with gaming culture, cultures in your life, then you will know that we have these, these bloody battles over, you know, uh, whether you're playing on the on the PC, whether you're a mobile game player, if you're a PlayStation or Xbox, and these things have existed for a long time. When I was maybe age seven or eight, we would have these discussions of, you know, whether you like Sega or Nintendo games, and that would somehow define you, <laughs> define you as a person. Or if you play, if you play on the on the PC or if you play on the Amiga 500, uh, all sorts of things. Whether you like sports games or shoot 'em ups, do you like simulators? Do you like, you know, we we have all sorts of these weird social identity groupings, and of course, it's a it's an element of, of all, all of our culture, not just gaming culture. Uh, we do it with sports teams. We do it with Star Trek versus Star Wars. Are you this, are you that? 
I, I will not launch into a rant on, you know, these kind of bubbles or silos, but it's good to recognize that we have these kind of uh, groups of our own. Uh, we all need to belong in, in some groups and we define ourselves through different things. Uh, when I'm talking about gaming cultures, it's not just the playing of games. It's not just the games themselves, but it's broader engagement with them. So, for example, this lecture is is gaming culture. This is discussing gaming culture. Um, if, a, if a parent at home talks to their children about gaming, uh, that's gaming culture. Uh, someone, someone develops a game or someone makes a game in a game jam, shares, that's gaming culture, and so on and so on and so on. All sorts of interactions that involve gaming culture or, and this, of course, means that we have a whole load of them. And there are, of course, very many interconnected actors in these gaming cultures, people who come into contact with games and gaming uh, in different ways. Um, we don't always consider them as shaping gaming culture. But if we, and for example, parents are a, are a prime example. We don't always consider, you know, parents to be actors in gaming culture. We think that it's it's their children who play the games, but of course, it's the parents who give money for the games. It's the parents who set limits on gaming. It's the parents who allow or disallow the play of game. It's the it's the parents that you know drive the children up to land parties. It's the parents who buy the buy the hardware and so on and so on and so on. Or it's maybe you know it's the youth worker who organizes organizes gaming activities at a very small small Finnish town somewhere, uh, spends the youth work budget on buying two gaming PCs just that, so that the local young people have something to something to do at the uh, at the youth centers or so on. So we have all sorts of actors there, not just the people who make games or or play them, but also these people who are all around them. And of course uh, academics, researchers are, are a major part of this as well, and the gaming media. And of course, these actors are, are or these roles are often in, overlapping. For example, for me, uh, I am I'm also, like I'm a researcher, I play games myself. Uh, as a game jammer, I've some, sometimes made games of my own. Uh, I have a godson. Uh, for for them, I'm kind of a regulator of gaming, or I discuss gaming with them, and so on, and so on, and so on. As a media expert, uh, as a, if I'm giving professional training to to doctors or whatever, so lots of different roles that are going on at the same time. So gaming culture has a lot of problems. Uh, 99 is just something that I borrow, borrowed, but it and it's probably not enough. There's I'm, I think there's a fair bit, fair few more. Uh, we have all sorts of problems, but uh, different uh, problems in terms of scale, different in terms of severity uh, from, from various sources, some from outside gaming culture, some from inside gaming culture. The things that I've picked out today is first up is toxicity. We will be talking about toxic gaming cultures and what toxicity uh, means, what, what does it, how is it hurting gaming culture, what could we maybe do about it? There is ethical and unethical design. There's problematic gaming. And then, of course, always bubbling under capitalism. Uh, and this is, this is basically underlining the fact that for a large part, uh, the gaming industry is very much an industry. Uh, this is a hobby. This is a way of life for many. But it's, it's built on con consumerism. It's built on uh, we are buying and playing games. We are making them and so on. So of course it's not the entire picture, but it's it's impossible to remove money from the equation. Uh, that's this is something that we will be tackling. And these issues they're not separate; they're very much connected. I hope to illustrate this later on. Uh, and I find it it's important to point out that that all the problems that we have here they're not because of individual actors in the in gaming cultures. Usually, uh, they they find their focus in in the acts of individuals like individual companies individual people but they are still there far broader structural issues that are have been baked into the system like over years and years and years and we have kind of accepted them and normalized them and that's what also makes them quite difficult to address so you know even though you can have for example an individual player being very toxic online uh, but it's, you know, toxicity isn't just about this single person being toxic, but it's this culture of toxicity that enables this kind of behavior. So 
now I'll go into the German um, and the Finnish as well. So I'll be talking shortly about something called Gaming Bildung. And in Finnish, it's Peli Sivistus. A uh, few words on the translation. So the word Sivistus, which is in Swedish building, in German Bildung. There is no word for it in English, which is always a source of, source of humor. Uh, it means cultivation, refinement, maturation, education. So sort of growing as a person, I think, is is a good way to summarize it. Uh, fulfilling human potential, becoming better. Uh, it's more than just acquiring skills and knowledge. It's um, becoming kind of more human, uh, taking steps in the right direction. Very loaded term as well. And there is this ethical com component to it. So it's not just gathering knowledge. It's also... It's also using this knowledge for good, to try and build a better world, live a better life. Uh, and of course, this building, when it's, when it's uh, framed as gaming building, then this is using this building in a gaming context. And of course, it's also like, it's more than just having this functional game literacy, knowing as much as possible about games, or for example. And it's not just gaming culture capital. Uh, like uh, if you know how much damage you know, this and this weapon in Mass Effect does when equipped with, with this kind of stats and this this ammo, then this is this does not yet, you know, ensure that you you have you are very like you have a lot of building in terms of, of gaming. You might have a lot of a lot of culture capital if you know this kind of trivia, but it might not still help you make sense of gaming cultures. So I have defined it so that it's it's in in one part it's a process. So we, we are constantly reflecting on and uh, critically examining our views, our opinions, and our knowledge of gaming cultures. Uh, we have to think about what we know, what we don't know, and so on and so on. Uh, we acquire new knowledge. We acquire new perspectives. Hopefully today on this lecture, I'll be able to provide you with some, with some new perspectives. Uh, and of course, we always need this sort of thing. No matter how much existing information we already have, how much existing knowledge, we still need uh, need these new points of view, new perspectives, so we can examine our existing ones. So, as a very simple uh, example, is when I went to the went to the gaming risk prevention, got the gaming risk pre prevention job. And you know, before I started there, I was just thinking, like, oh, you know, I've been gaming for so long. I'm just gonna march in, and I will tell these, you know, people like and I will tell these people in the NGO line of work because you know they probably don't know anything about gaming. So I'm just gonna march in. I'm gonna tell them how it is. Uh, I'm gonna sort of make them understand that there's actually, you know, there is no issues in gaming and gaming culture. And then, you know, after a week or so, I had had to, you know, sort of eat a lot of humble pie and realize that there were actually quite a lot of things in gaming culture that I had never, uh, never thought about. I had never encountered them really, or I had never considered them to be uh, problematic. Uh, I had always sort of, sort of just assumed that this is how things are and so on and so on. This, and this experience was a large part of my, large part of my uh, development of this kind of build, building approach. And then, of course, another perspective is that if I'm going to a school, for example, for example, to talk to uh, talk to parents or talk to teachers about gaming, then they often have their own uh, pre-held notions about gaming, and maybe it's quite often it can be tinged with worry or or it can be very negative. But then I try and point out new perspectives again to have them reflect on why they're thinking the way that they do. And of course, not just accumulating this information, but also using it in an ethical and constructive way. These are, of course, very difficult to define what is what is an ethical and constructive way. So I'm conveniently leaving this to people, uh, to people to judge sort of themselves uh, and as a, as a source for ethical considerations as well. Uh, what I consider ethical or constructive might not be uh, what you consider ethical and constructive. But we need this kind of processing. We need this kind of discussion, comparison of, of perspectives to sort of get ahead in life. So it's also competence. So it's not just process, but it is this collection of knowledge and skills that, that builds as we, as we approach the thing, as we acquire more knowledge, as we process it, we critically reflect upon it. So there is, of course, this kind of repository of knowledge that builds throughout the years. Uh, no one has 
no one has no competence and no one has full competence. So we're always on a spectrum. Um, and there is, of course, no set or clearly defined content for it. Uh, there isn't like a list of 10 things that you need to know and then your, then your competence is, building competence is perfect. So it varies based on individual needs and interests. For example, the, the things that uh, gaming companies, community manager needs and the things that they need to understand are different maybe from what a doctor who doesn't play games at all needs to under, understand in order to treat uh, young, uh, young people who have issues with gaming. So we need different kinds of knowledge. There is no single measuring stick that we can compare our existing, uh, existing gaming knowledge against unless you're in, in a pub quiz, but this is, this is a bit broader. Uh, so it, what I always en encourage people to do is in, in order not to get overwhelmed by all the information and all the critical perspectives in the world is to consider what are the things that are very important for them as an individual to know about gaming culture, what should they be aware of? What should they be reflecting on? And it's of course never ready. It's never finished. It's always always evolving. Uh, every single day, everything we experience about gaming, everything we read about gaming and so on and so on and so on. It's always this process is happening and there's something going on. It's not maybe always conscious even, but there is still development and hopefully forward. Uh, there can be some regress, regression as well, but, but hopefully we're always developing into a better direction. And then, of course, uh, underlying this all is gaming building as an ideal, which is really important. Uh, we need this ideal uh, that seeking to understand gaming cultures is important in itself. If we don't consider this important, then you know, why bother? Uh, then, we can, then we can just do something else with our, with our time. Uh, for a parent's example, for example, this can be quite a tricky idea to bring across why should they, they be interested in in learning about games but then if you tie it to you know it's important for your children so it, it should be important for you as well to know at least that something about it then it can start making a little sense and uh, yeah we need to value this information uh, and we can't really skimp on the ideals and we need all of all these three components because if if we don't have the process, then uh, then the com we never built the competence. Uh, the com competence we already have it's never renewed. It it never develops. It's just stuck. Uh, and this can this can happen um, again. If I'm talking about uh, like talking from experience, uh, many people many people you know have played games when they were young, but now you know after. 15 years, gaming culture has evolved, but maybe their knowledge hasn't. Uh, and then this can lead to outdated knowledge. If your, if your considerations of digital gaming, for example, are still built around, you know, NES or, or Super NES or something like this, then obviously, you know, modern, modern online games are, are a fair bit different. And even, and it doesn't have to go back that far. If, if the last time you were playing games was in the early 2000s, then, uh, you might struggle grasping a mobile game in 2021, even though you you know I was a real real hardcore gamer back in 2000. But you know 2000 is 21 years ago. It's not it's not you know uh, five years ago as it always feels like it is. And then once when we have this competence, then it also fuels the process. Uh, we we have information that we can reflect reflect upon. We can compare our existing and new information. Uh, we have this kind of fuel for all of, all of the things that is hap that are happening. Um, it feeds into our curiosity. Now we know something about something, and uh, and once we know something, then we are often tempted to learn more about. It. We we become curious, like why is this thing so? And you know, has it ever been different? And should it be different in the future? And so on and so on. And then. We again go to the process. We start looking for more information uh, to develop our competence. And as mentioned before, the ideal is a requirement for all of this. Uh, if if we don't consider this kind of competence as as meaningful, then we don't need the process either. Uh, it's just a just a waste of time if we don't consider gaming culture knowledge or this kind of building useful. So. 
why is this important? That's that's enough with the German. Uh, I don't think I will be introducing anything anything more in the on the German front. Uh, but yeah, uh, one thing that I do like to tackle is the is the fact that when we are actors in gaming culture, then especially if we are very invested in gaming, if we are dealing with gaming a lot, then we often tend to end up thinking that we are experts on the subject uh, and we are experts on on everything related to gaming. But this is something that I do want to do want to tackle. This is something that I, I also talk about with our with our uh, game studies master's students at Tampere. That you know even if we consume a lot of games, even if we participate in games and gaming culture and even if we create games for a living, it does not automatically make us experts. Uh, if this sounds somehow like outrageous or provocative, I don't think it is. Um, just as a very simple example, I have a car. Uh, I own a car. I drive a car fairly often. I have ridden in cars since I was very small. I sit on the bus many times per week and so on and so on and so on. So I'm very much engaging with cars. Uh, I don't know how a car works. Uh, I don't know how... Uh, I don't know the the pollution levels or the output levels of of my car. Uh, I don't know most of the technical specs of my car. As long as it's moving, I'm quite happy with it. I know how to how to fill it up with gas. Uh, I don't know anything about the about the make of my car. I don't know anything about the about the make of or like the history of the make of my car. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. So something that I should be actually quite intimately familiar with. Because it's a it's an everyday thing that I uh, that I use that I engage with, and and I don't I don't understand the principles behind it. I don't understand really the culture. Uh, it's it's just something that I live with. And now, if we replace car with game or gaming culture, uh, then we can probably come up with uh, with a lot of things that we are not, aren't actually thinking about, uh, even though we are we are engaging it with a lot. Uh, or, so, so yeah, uh, we need these these different perspectives. Uh, for example, before before I started uh, started talking about games and gaming with with Arco, yeah, who is our our lovely host here, uh, I hadn't actually ever considered that. Oh yeah, like developing games is also a part of gaming culture, which obviously it, it's it's a like why wouldn't you think that it is? You know, obviously someone has to make those games. But Yay. I had always been. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Uh, because I had always been interested in in firstly playing games myself, and I have always been interested in in the people who play games, not the games in themselves or making them. And and you know, you would think that is that is it's obvious, but no, it's it's not. Hmm. Uh, I I can bet you that ev everyone who is currently listening to this talk. Like no matter how experienced you are, no matter how much you know about gaming cultures, there are there are so many subjects that, that you don't know about. Um, and this is not to put anyone down. This is how we all are. We none of us can be an expert in in everything. So it's more a question of whether we can whether we can uh, identify the gaps in our knowledge. Yeah, it's 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 a very good point that games are now so everything. So there's so much in games that nobody can really know everything there so yeah uh, thanks also for giving me a chance to drink um, <laughs> good yeah go on <laughs> so another, another thing that is really important is that we are often very uncritical about things we enjoy if you have a, had any engagement with you know geek culture for example then we can get very rapid rabid if if you know something that we hold dear is being is being challenged in some way uh, and we often overlook the negatives negatives in in what we uh, in what we enjoy, because we don't want to sort of bring these negative, negative considerations into something that we enjoy, or maybe we are we just we are not, just not paying attention to it because we never run into it, or, or so on and so on. If the if something is mostly beneficial for us, then you know why should we consider the the harmful side of it? And a very important reminder is that many of the worst gaming related things come from inside gaming culture. I think there is this this long held belief that you know threats to gaming culture are are basically coming from outside 
and this is maybe how it used to be in the in the 80s in the 90s you would have these moral panics about dungeons and dragons you would have you would have you know people be worried about, about young people spraining their wrists playing in the arcades uh there were there have been all these this aggression and violence debates and so on and so on and and in these cases we can identify that these are people you know attacking gaming culture or or gaming cultures from the outside but of course you know if we look at things like uh, things like online hate uh if we look at things like like fan reactions to delayed games if we look at look at behavior in in games and so on and so on and so on then we can actually quite quite quickly see that these are coming from inside of gaming culture so it's uh we have such a lot of people in the world playing games and it's it's obvious that uh, we are going to have conflicting views over things something that i like i'm not that happy with it really but that i like to remind people of is that you know neo nazis like playing games just the same as as the rest of us um so there is isn't anything like mythical making game players different from everyone else or separating us from the rest of the world and then we have these cognitive biases uh while the dunning kruger effect has been sort of debated whether it's it's actually there but th- there is this idea that that you know the less uh, the less we know then the more confident we are about our our views so uh we are we think that we are very uh very adept at something we think that we know a lot about something but in fact we just we don't we do not possess the knowledge uh we do not we do not have enough insight to realize that we don't actually know all that much about it if you want to see this this uh in action then just go on twitter go on youtube look at any any videos comments and on any sensitive subject and you will see a lot of experts there who are obviously overlooking a lot of the a lot of the important aspects while being also very toxic on on second hand don't go don't go to twitter don't go to youtube comments it's actually very bad advice it's monday and another important thing to remember is that we are all human this is something that we cannot escape uh, and i'm i'm glad that we can't as humans we have opinions we have feelings we have different views we have different experiences of the world and all of these can very easily be confused for objective truths and of course this isn't just gaming this is this is about life in general uh if you haven't caught on by now then this this is very much like a life in general lecture as well um but um as a, again as an example if my experience of of gaming culture is very positive uh i have never i have been super lucky and i have never encountered toxic culture for example no one has ever called me names online and so on and so on then it's very easy for me to think that you know if someone is saying that gaming culture is super toxic then obviously they're wrong because you know i haven't surely i would have seen it if 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 it was so and then i'm actually replacing uh, or like just viewing my personal experience as truth uh, and also ignoring the other person's experience uh, so yeah applies to a lot of lot of things in life uh we should be aware of when we are having an opinion when is when is it just a feeling when is it back, backed up by research uh and this again uh and i want to stress that uh this doesn't mean that opinions feelings and experience that that they are invalid and of course of course they are not uh they are actually quite valuable and they tell, tell us quite a lot it's just we have to be uh aware of when when are they when are they feelings when are they guesses when are they just intuition and when when is there something maybe broader going on and of course we'll never escape ourselves we'll never be rid of biased views but we can identify our views we can acknowledge their existence and try to compensate for them uh again uh when i'm talking to parents uh there are some parents who who are very much into gaming uh they 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 like gaming a lot as well as some professionals who are very they enjoy gaming and for these people it can actually be be quite challenging to get them to acknowledge some of the risks involved because they are they are positively inclined towards gaming 
So it can be very easy to overlook some of the negatives. So it's not just always, you know, trying to turn around negative views. Sometimes it's also bringing some realism into like overly positive views. If you look looked into game based learning, learning research or public discourse, then there is often this huge hype around it that is not always very grounded in in reality. Uh, but that doesn't stop it from being very popular. Uh, Really importantly, we need to accept that the world is very complex. We need to deal with it somehow. Uh, usually, my advice is through reflection and more knowledge. It's uh, again, it's a very idealistic view, maybe, but but I think that that's one of the only ways that we can actually progress. And it's it's good to keep in mind as, as well that most of these problems in gaming culture, they're not intentionally created. I don't believe that there's there's a lot of people out there who are like inherently evil. And they want to set in these these problems. Um, there are, of course, very human things affecting this. Uh, you know, just being unthinking, uh, not being very empathetic, being greedy, for example, and these kind of things. But there isn't like a skeletor kind of person like cackling somewhere and making making things intentionally very evil. It doesn't mean that the problems aren't there, but it's the intentionality is also something to consider. So we finally get to the problems. Uh, and I have promised to talk somewhat about toxic cultures. Uh, and I have outlined some uh, forms of toxicity that happens in gaming cultures. <clears throat> and I have uh, divided them into two. First of all, we have the gaming side. Uh, and, then, and this is, I think, often the very obvious, obvious side of toxic, toxic gaming cultures. So we have outright, outright blatant hate speech, for example. We have racism, we have sexism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and so on. It's a depressing list. Uh, there is a lot of work being done to combat it in different ways, but it's also something that is very much connect, uh, connected to the world in general. As, as mentioned before, all sorts of people play games, uh, and you know you can't keep the keep the hateful people from playing games. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of issues in gaming culture that maybe enable this kind of this kind of environment. We aren't always we aren't always addressing it very uh, very concretely. We aren't always stepping up, try to make it make it better. Uh, often the solution can be just like oh you know just put your put it on mute, uh, put it on mute. Don't play with strangers. Uh, just ignore ev everything you see. Uh, and 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 so on and so on and so on. So it's it's more a case of like uh, mitigating the impact on the individual rather than actually seeking to solve the solve the issue. Uh, and of course, this doesn't extend just games as they're played, but also the the different forums outside outside of gaming. If you've ever taken a look at at 4chan or Uli Lauta or some of the Reddit threads or Twitter or any social media platform, then you will see a lot of this. A lot of this going on, and of course, this is something that often reaches the, uh, like the, rises into public interest as well. So you will see discussions of toxic gaming culture, and it's it's good that we have these discussions. Uh, hopefully, it will also result in change as well. And uh, and of course, like an even more extreme version of this is that uh, is is harassment. So it's instead of it just being well, it's, I'm, I'm not going to say it, it's just speech. Uh, speech can be very hurtful. Speech can be very threatening. Uh, it can be, it is enough to, to prosecute someone. Uh, but, uh, but then, of course, we have harassment that, that uh, yes, as well as online, takes place offline as well. Uh, we, get, we get doxing, getting people's, people's personal contact details. We have people, you know, uh, doing swattings and things like this, sending police around to someone's house. And, and again, it's not just the people who play games, uh, it's the developers who make games. You, you nerf some weapon by two points and then you're getting death threats and you're, you're getting, and there's like hopes on Twitter that your family gets cancer and dies. So this sort of thing. Uh, there are streamers who are very public figures, YouTubers as well. Who are who are attack, attacked for you know sometimes just for just for exposition sometimes just you know for I, I assume just for being there 
um, sometimes for espousing views that the viewers don't agree with, uh, different activists. The, the more someone is making, like working to make game culture better or addressing issues of toxicity, then the more likely it is that they will, I assume that they will, will, get, will get harassed. Uh, it's again, as mentioned before, it's very difficult to be, uh, or it's easy to be uncritical about things you love. And it's been terribly shown in gaming culture. Uh, gamers can be the worst. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm quite, I'm quite happy to say that when I was in my, in my twenties, I probably, you know, would have been just like your, your average gamer, uh, like the average toxic, really nasty gamer. I have, you know, I have been the guy who is on on some forums and going like, you know, all the feminists are ruining everything. Uh, I'm not terribly proud of it, of course, but it's I'm quite happy that I'm maybe progressed a little bit in my in my thinking. And it's also I like to remind people of that, that, you know, you can change views of thinking as well. Uh, no one is no one is born perfect. It's whether you want to take take feedback, uh, whether you want to actually develop your thinking. And then we have these meritocracies built around gaming as well. This myth that you know you will go far in gaming culture just based on your own, on your own skill, uh, regardless of of structures like gender or or race or sexuality. Uh, we see it in expressions like you know get good, uh, the PC master race, which has a lovely Nazi vibe to it. Uh, discussions of you know mentions of filthy casuals. So this sort of a sort of thing where we label label different gamers who is a real gamer who is skillful enough to be a, a gamer who is accepted who is welcome who is not um, and again these can very very easily easily turn toxic gaming culture is very uh, very ripe for this uh, because there is the inbuilt idea of you know developing your skills and becoming as good as possible and of course there's nothing inherently wrong about becoming as good as possible but it cannot become this kind of uh, explanation for everything. Uh, we can't, you know, let's take something like like women competitors in esports. We cannot simply address it by saying saying that oh, you know, girls aren't good at video games, so that's why you don't have any esports professionals that are women, or you have very few. Uh, that's a very simplistic explanation that completely, you know, takes away the. Uh, the poten potential impacts of of gender, for example, uh, we avoid discussing all the tricky questions about about uh, sexism in gaming culture and so on. So it's you know it's not always obviously just how well you are playing these games, and this ties into like broader broader structures in in society, where you know people are if people are poor or they're unwell, so then it's kind of made made to be their fault. You know, they are weak, they are not the winners, uh, and so they deserve what they are getting. And this is, of course, a very toxic way of thinking. And then we have the industry side. Uh, I'll be the first to say that I'm not the most familiar with it, but I, I do, have, do have a fair few friends who work in the industry, and I do like to follow it. And this is something that we have had to look into also when we've been developing the game jam learning stuff. So we have things like like crunch and other destructive working working practices where we're basically basically just you know draining draining the 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 human capital uh, we are we are making the making the people actually making the games kind of subservient to the to the market needs uh, pushing pushing and pushing and pushing people to the point of burnout whether it's you know game development or if it's esports for example uh, constantly working people too hard uh, lots of Lots of um, really destructive practices there going on, and then we have, of course, structures like race and gender in the industry. So it's very much still um, still a white man's industry, so to say. Uh, we have uh, we need to consider whether we have people of of different different ages, different skin colors, different genders, different sexualities working in working in games, and it's not just you know for this kind of um, surface uh, uh, sur this kind of like a real surface image of what is, what is going on and just this surface representation but it's also like what kind of views are we are we getting into games uh, if it's if it's a game that you are only working on with I don't know like if I 
think about my own friends. So if we were to make a game, then we would be, you know, like five straight Finnish white guys in our 30s, 40s. Uh, we can, you know, try and come up with ideas that kind of reflect uh, reflect the world in a more diverse way. But but we none of us has the experience actually. So we will end up bringing our own biases into the into the game. And of course, all of these. All of these issues in gaming culture, these toxic issues are quite ingrained and they're quite accepted. And that's why they are hard to get rid of. It's still quite common to hear that things like, you know, trash talk and toxicity, that they are acceptable ways to participate in gaming culture. They're kind of like a part of the whole thing. Uh, the main, main way to cope with them should be just, you know, develop a thicker skin and learn how to mute. Uh, so we have been kind of keeping up this kind of culture. It was really sad to read about a study on these like 15 year old uh, American teens about online gaming. And even, you know, the, the 15 year olds were already teaching their younger siblings that, oh, you know, the, the way to deal with trash talk is just, you know, give back as hard as, as you, you get. So sort of just keep going with this kind of cycle. Uh, and this, and of course, just accepting it that you know this is how gaming culture is, and we are not going to change this. So better just roll with it. And of, of course, this way the world never changes and never gets better. How do we how do we do something? Do this. This is the only time I will be talking about detoxing. I hate the term de digital detox, for example, but this is now cultural detox. First of all, of course, we we need to acknowledge the problems that we are having. We need to listen to the people who are bringing these problems to light. Uh, we need to stop uh, belittling this, these issues. Uh, we need to stop accepting that these are a part of gaming culture that we can't change. Uh, much as like I like the, these kind of efforts where you know people uh, condemn toxic behavior companies come out or industry groups come out and they say like, oh, you know, toxic behavior is terrible and we totally condemn it. But obviously, obviously you condemn it. We like, un unless you're horrible, then you condemn it. But what is that going to achieve if it's not, if it's not backed up by concrete action? I can, you know, I can con condemn a million, million things per day and it, it won't change, change a thing. Like we all condemn things like racism, we all condemn Nazis, uh, and you know they're still there. So that's why we need concrete action. So not just this kind of kind of signaling, not just PR stuff. First of all, we need education. We need we need to be able to identify where these problems stem from. Uh, we need to be aware of the of the broader structures around them. Uh, why are why is like uh, like racism a thing in games? Uh, why are these gendered structures a problem in games? Shouldn't everyone be equal because we're all there and we're all anonymous? So we we have to look in look into that. We have to be aware. And you know, lucky as we are, there are people who are very well versed in these issues. There are people who have been writing about these things. Uh, there are people who consult about these things. Um, there is a lot, lot of information out there if we are prepared to look for it. Uh, we need concrete tools uh, if in, in the case of games. Uh, it's nice to condemn, but if your game doesn't have a report feature, for example, if your game doesn't have any sort of tool for, uh, for someone harassed in your game to get in contact, if they have to go, if they have to jump through like 10 hoops of different, different feedback forms, uh, just in order to file a report that no one no one's ever going to read, then you know why bother uh, why bother condemning if that is the if that is the option you're giving. We need dedicated professionals. Someone uh, if again if we are developing games, we need people in those gaming companies whose main purpose is to address these kind of issues. Uh, I, I assume that you know when people are developing cars, then there are some people. There is some. There is some group there that is you know responsible for airbags. I would hope so. Uh, there is some some group in, in charge of of seat belts. We need this kind of thing. Uh, this this isn't just kind of like an afterthought. This isn't someone you hire part time uh, in order to again do some PR. Uh, in, instead. 
there is a lot of lot of work to do here. And a very good example has has been recently the uh, the game Among Us. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And they all of a sudden they they shot into huge success, and then they realized that oh you know we have we have a player base of hundreds of millions, uh, and we don't really have any proper tools to moderate. We don't know what's going on in our games. Uh, we don't have you know we don't know if if people are for example uh, adults are coming in and playing games with with ten or eleven year olds. And then you know start sending them suggestive messages or or trying to get their personal details because they hadn't prepared for this huge success. And of course, you know you can't always prepare for everything, but it's a it's a good example that you know if if you don't have these systems in place, then it can be quite quite tricky to get them in later. And again, collaboration between fields. Uh, there are NGOs out there, there are companies out there who are working with issues of harassment. For example, issues with toxicity, issues with online behavior. There, are, there in Finland, for example, there is a massive field of of media educators, and they're uh, and they're all too happy to you know talk about talk about uh, toxicity in gaming and and how to how to prevent harassment and things like this. And again, it's it's a matter of whether you are looking looking these people up, whether you are making the effort to connect, or uh, if you are just uh, considering that, oh, you know, maybe this isn't important enough that we should actually dedicate any resources to this. Uh, we need individual action. This is something that I tell young game players. Gaming cultures aren't something that, that's happening out there somewhere. All of us are actors. And, and you know, if in, in a very simplified idea, you know, if, if, none, if no game player, if everyone was just, you know, taking care of themselves and everyone refrained from being toxic online you know then we wouldn't have online toxicity but we cannot rely on people to act like this so that's why we also need need structural action we need need to tackle this like as industries we, not, we need to tackle this this as as researchers as communities make this like get these larger wheels wheels turning but of course at the same time we can't forget about the individual level. We can't trust that you know the industry will deal with this, or you know the researchers will deal with this, or the NGOs will deal with this, or the parents or whoever. Uh, we need to put the message out there and kind of uh, enforce it that we. It's not just something that's abstract. You can, like for your for your own very 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 small section of the internet, and you can make sure that you are acting in a non toxic way in that in that small stamp sized uh, area of the internet and then do we have systems in place for uh, for dealing with retaliation you start speaking out against toxic culture then there will be a black backlash whether you are an activist whether you are a company whether you are a researcher then it's it's almost guaranteed and maybe some people don't do it because of this uh, you don't you don't maybe want to get for some reason, you don't want to get the, the death threats. You don't want to get doxxed. Uh, you don't want to get get you know 100 messages per day telling telling you that you should die and so on and so on. Uh, in companies, you should have systems in place for this. In universities, you should have systems in place for this. Is there is there a support network, for example, for researchers or professionals or activists who get harassed? Um, how do communities deal with deal with this if if this kind of behavior comes up and so on? So yeah, it's a very, very tricky subject. No easy answers there. But but on the other hand, there are a lot of people working with this. So hopefully there are some fruitful collaborations out there. Another issue often comes up is problematic gaming, uh, which is what we call uncontrolled playing behavior. Uh, so a player has difficulties keeping their gaming, gaming under check. So they're playing more than they would like to. So it's not measured by a given number of hours, for example, but instead it's the it's the idea of whether you are in control of your gaming. If you would like to play less, but you find yourself still, you know, playing playing to excess, then this can be a sign that your gaming is problematic in some way. It's sometimes uh, talked about as gaming addiction, uh, which is a term I don't like. It uh, it I think it uh, connects it too much to substance abuse, for example. Uh, and it doesn't really describe the problem all that well. Uh, 
the, the official uh, diagnosis for it is gaming disorder. So comparable, for example, let's say eating disorder. So it's some, it's some kind of uh, normal behavior that has become disordered for some reason. It's often related to other issues in life, depression, loneliness, uh, bullying at school, things like this. Uh, all sorts of different, different and difficult life situations. Uh, gaming, uh, game mechanics are a component of it, but the research is, is quite unclear. Uh, and this, this is a very contested issue in research and gaming culture in general. There are people, people who do not acknowledge that this sort of phenomenon exists. Uh, there are people who consider or who think that it exists, but don't agree on the term. This is the situation I think currently in the, in the research field. There's discussion of whether, you know, is this actually, should this be a diagnosis in itself or is this just more generally addict, addictive behavior that is being manifested in the context of games? Uh, and of course, for players, it can be quite difficult to accept this whole concept. But then again, uh, I think if you play games actively, then you have at least some experiences at some point in your life that some gaming session ends up running far longer than you thought that it would. Uh, you, are, you are thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to stop at, at 11 o'clock and go to bed. And then, you know, I'm going to stop at, at 12 o'clock. And then, I'm, you know, I'm going to stop at half past one at the very latest. And then, you know, at some point it's, it's three o'clock. You're tired and you're, you're achy uh, and you're, you're, you're sad. The next day you're, you're going to feel bad, of course, because you've been sleeping for four hours and this sort of thing. So this, sort of, this kind of thing happens. So it's nothing, it's nothing magical. It's nothing mystical. Uh, and if this keeps happening, you know, time and time and time again, then we are talking about problematic gaming. So there is, we don't need to have this sort of really uh, mystical, <laughs> mystical aura surrounding this. This is kind of uh, normal, understandable behavior for whatever reason. If you are very depressed and gaming makes you feel better, then it's very human to play a lot of games, even though, even though it, it hurts your life in other ways. And this, of course, makes it very tricky because gaming isn't uh, necessarily a, a bad thing, like a fully bad thing in this. Actually, it's, it can often be that gaming is very important, gaming is very healthy, and gaming is very unhealthy at the same time. If you are very lonely, then the games can be your only social contact, which obviously is good for you. But at the same time, they can narrow down your life. You don't want to leave your home, especially the, with the COVID situation. That's, you know, we're already staying at home all the time. Uh, but maybe, you know, you're, you're getting everything you need. You feel like you need uh, from the games. So, you know, why bother with school, for example? Why bother with meeting people face to face or, or so on? So these are really, really tricky and complicated issues. And of course, it's also a very emotional subject. Uh, we have some, sometimes we have personal connections to it. Uh, Sometimes it's just something, you know, we don't want to acknowledge that gaming could be problematic, especially if we like it a lot. And then there's the historical baggage. So it's been this, uh, uh, the, the, we have these moral panics, for example, related to it. Uh, we have like very strong condemnation of the, of the phenomenon from people who we maybe consider are not very, very into gaming. And sometimes it is, sometimes this is what happens. It's people who may, may not really understand gaming culture. And then they, you know, start speaking about dopamine. And it's just, you know, it's all about dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. And, and they have no idea what's going on with gaming culture. So again, this makes the discussion a, a little difficult. No real easy solutions for this, which is a, a recurring theme on this talk. Many of these like problematic gaming issues, they're often deeply personal like bullying or loneliness. And often they may require professional help. Uh, so I, I do like to underline that this isn't an issue for gaming companies or game players themselves to solve. So they, they can be kind of actual, actual medical issues, especially if they tie into things like depression. Uh, it's, it is no gaming company's job to deal with young people's depression. Uh, and and no, no company probably has like the suitable resources or expertise for it. Of course, um, if, if someone wants to do this, then, you know, it's, it's, a, welcome, it's a welcome effort, of course. Uh, but at the same time, the communities and the industry can help. So communities, for example, can acknowledge the existence of these issues, can share information about this, create awareness, uh, make space for talking about these things. 
uh, and and again collaborate with other professionals, people who are are dealing with with uh, this as professionals, mental health specialists, problematic gaming specialists, and so on. Uh, one thing that people who do feel that they have problems with gaming, one thing that they have brought up, for example, is that they don't want to bring up their situation in gaming communities because they they get laughed at. Uh, their their problems get ridiculed. They they you know they're just they just get this ah oh, you know stop your whining get good and then we're back into the meritocracy, you know if you want to if you want to not be a problematic gamer then you know just pick yourself up by your shoelaces and and you know just grit your teeth and play less. It's you know this is this is how we do it. Uh, so at least doing this can be a way to address it at a very very basic level. Make people aware if you're running communities. Make sure that there is uh, there is information available for people who might might feel that they they have problems. Uh, even if you don't have any people in your community who have problems with gaming, then you know the only thing you have done is provided potential resources. So it's not you ha you haven't really lost anything. Uh, what the industry can do is take a look at take a look at the mechanics in their games. Are there things that that might be tricky for uh, uh, people vulnerable to problematic gaming? Are there things that, and I'll come back to it in in ethical design soon. Uh, are there are there things that are, or mechanics that are designed, for example, to exploit this sort of uh, addictive personalities? People people who are maybe prone to playing in this way. Are there tools in the game to Control your gaming is are there can the can the player for example choose to have pop-ups come up you know every 30 minutes can the player see how much money or time they have used on the game uh, how transparent is the game and so on and so on and again consultation and collaboration with professionals uh, there is a lot of information out there if the companies if the industry is willing to listen uh, rather than playing this kind of like a defensive game. Uh, and may possibly even denying the problems and designing responsibly a few words on that. Uh, I'm all for proactive measures. If, if this becomes a very big problem, then we will have legislation. At some point, you know, if, if the problems aren't solved before, beforehand, then we will get, you know, the, the state, for example, come in and, you know, wield the legislation hammer uh, we are seeing it. We have seen it happen in in South Korea. We have seen it happen in happen in China. Uh, we have seen it happen in regard to loot boxes, for example, in European countries. So, I'm um, I'm all for you know acting before the legislation comes in because the legislation will always create additional problems, and we can be fairly certain that whoever is setting that legislation is probably maybe not the not the people most well versed in gaming culture intricacies. So we'd rather we should probably get to collaborating sooner rather than later. So the third thing to address is unethical design. And this is of course this is a huge gray area. Uh, there isn't a set line when a mechanic or design becomes unethical. Uh, why does it become unethical? If I if I point out some mechanics, then you can probably say, well, you know, this sounds unethical. Uh, or this sounds ethical, but it's really, really tricky to see. Or, you know, when when does the when does it actually shift? When do we move, you know, from the white to the black, or is there even a black or white? As a very concrete example, when I was working at Ehud, we would go to this uh, online service for for very young people. This uh, I will refrain from from naming here, but it was a service in which you created a character. And then you know you could buy you could buy things for your character. It's like a like a paper doll sort of thing. It was aimed at you know kids around age ten to twelve approximately. Uh, and you could you could play play all sorts of games in the in the on the platform and so on. And you know we created accounts there because we went there to talk with children. And I had created my my account and then I logged out of the of the platform. And the first email that I received, I think, was two hours after log off, which was, you know, oh, you know, we're already missing you. Like, please come back. Uh, okay, you know, the next 
The next email came maybe, you know, after, after another hour. Oh, you know, we like all of your, you know, your pets are suffering. Uh, if you, if you come back now, we'll give you extra coins and so on and so on and so on. I was getting these messages maybe every hour or so. And every time they were promising me something more, you know, you get, you get five free spins of the wheel of fortune and you get an, you get an additional piece of clothing and you get this and you get that. And this was in a service that was directed to 10 or 10 to 12 year olds. Uh, and they, they were basically the, the producer was, uh, was basically guilt tripping children into coming back and then bribing them with, with all sorts of, all sorts of things. Uh, I assume that in in this case we can pretty easily agree that this this wasn't the most ethical design possible. It was, and of course, it was directed at children. Uh, but many other situations aren't as clear cut. People will often ask parents, for example, like, "What do I think about addictive mechanics?" Uh, I don't know. I like I like a lot of addictive mechanics. Addictive mechanics can be really fun. That's why they're addictive. Uh, a good game is often addictive. Uh, you can't really draw a line when when does a game become like exploitative and when is it just good fun and exploitative for whom and is it directed at children or or adult players or so on and so on and so on. Uh, and often these come down to to sort of matters of conscience. If if the is the designer when you're designing some sort of mechanic, for example, uh, how do you feel about it? Are you, is the designer thinking like, oh, you know, this, this does feel a bit shady, but it, can, it also does, does feel like it's going to be very, very profitable. Uh, and that's when you, you're going to need to try and be a decent, decent human being. And this is, again, of course, where we, we come back to capitalism that I mentioned. Uh, and, that, and a question that was, was brought up before the lecture as well, balancing this sort of design with, uh, with profit it's it's not a very easy equation how do you do some how how can you get people to invest in your game invest their time invest their money uh, but also without you know luring them into the game too much and you know, there's obvious there's no there's no solution to it uh, it's very easy to cop out of difficult questions oh you know we're just making the best game we can uh, we are not at all responsible for how players use our game which can be a sort of valid, valid response, but it's also, I think, it's a it's a bit of a cop out response. It's it's basically saying, you know, we are not at all responsible for the product we are creating. Uh, you know, if you're having problems with it, then it's your it's your problem. And of course, especially when we're designing for kids and youth, uh, questions of ethical design become especially especially important. Where uh, I'm not going to speak about vulnerable populations, but we have especially with children, media literacy skills are still un underdeveloped. Uh, they do not have the critical capacity to, uh, to re reflect on your game, and they don't always realize the kind of uh, tricks you are pulling to get them, get them into the game. Not all adults do either, but at least adults have more, more facilities for reaching these conclusions. Things to consider. In ethical design, for example, how aggressive is the marketing? I'm coming coming back to the email spamming, for example, uh, and it's not you know just for children. If we are talking about someone who, for example, feels that they are gaming too much and they want to cut down on their gaming, are they getting are they getting you know notifications every five minutes? Please come back, please come back. This is what's happening. Uh, you know, while you were gone, fifteen minutes, then you know someone destroyed your village, and you know plundered your base and whatever. Uh, what's the content of in-game ads? This is a surprisingly common thing. This comes up in discussions with parents. Uh, parents have gotten some nice game for their children. Uh, they have checked the content. They have done everything as, as requested. And then, you know, the in-game ads are full of, you know, sex and violence and everyone is shocked. Of course, this is something that, that developers can have a limited impact on. It's usually a case of the of the platform, uh, but might also be worth con, uh, con contacting the platform about. And of course, this is something that needs to be solved at a platform level level as well. 
and I have to admit that this isn't isn't uh, something that I'm too aware of. So if there are people, you know, from the industry dealing with these service issues, then I'd be happy to know about this. Then age ratings and the transparency of of content in the games. In in Finland, we subscribe to the PEGI, the Pan European Game Information System of age ratings. But of course, with with mobile games, this this is often often played a little bit fast and loose. Is is the content transparent? Is the player going to get get surprise surprise content? Whether that is you know whether that is violent content or sexual content, gambling content, uh, is someone all of a sudden going to you know start sending the messages in the game? Are these apparent to the player when they start playing the game, or for the parents who are considering whether they can download the game for their children? Are there options for setting limits? Uh, we often talk about this in the context of of parents and children, but also in the in terms of problematic gaming, it can be very useful. Like, can you can you set a limit that your game you know that you can only play for an hour per day? Uh, can you get can you get pop ups again? Is is it transparent your your time used and so on? Uh, people who play problematically have, for example, brought up that these kind of pop ups, especially. Uh, could be could be useful, but of course also bringing up that maybe people would just turn them off. Uh, but again, we don't know until we try. And of course, a very 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 useful thing is you know if you're designing games, then whether you can sleep at night. If you can't, uh, if you can't sleep at night because you think that you are designing unethical games, then that might be telling you something. Listen to your heart, <laughs> possibly talk to your boss, maybe find some new place to work in. And of course, you know, I have joke, but this is also also something. These are these aren't easy questions. Uh, if if your if your options are you know doing unethical design or being unemployed, uh, it's it's not always easy. So uh, much as we would all like to be perfect people, then we are usually usually not. So whose fault is it? This is of course often a question that comes up. Uh, a very like common response is, you know, this isn't an industry issue. We can't control your children's game playing, whether it's loot boxes or violent content or anything like why, why, why don't parents take take care of your kids? And then the parents go, well, you know, this is the parenting issue. We can't fight the massive entertainment industry branch. Like, why do you keep putting this stuff in? You know that we can't deal with it. Um, uh, and yeah, and this is this is kind of a kind of a mood situation. We both arguments have their merits so maybe you know discussion could be better than arguing over whose job is it anyway uh one that i really hate there's very little we can do this is how gaming culture is well obviously this is how gaming culture is if no one is willing to do anything about it so maybe maybe at least try something uh culture form x let's say movies oh they also have problems so um, why are you singling out games which is it, which is basically just, I think, sort of whining. <laughs> it's like let the let the movie people deal with their issues. Let's deal with our issues. Um, the fact that that you know pe people in ice hockey or movies or music are doing doing worse or doing the same same kind of thing doesn't mean that that this is like a, that this is a, kind of like a permission for us to also also skip on those things. And then it's the audience that wants this. And again, we get into very tricky, tricky balancing. We want to, or you know, if you're creating, creating content, creating games, you probably want to listen to your audience, but what if your audience is demanding something that is, that is destructive uh, in terms of culture or in terms of your working culture, if your audience is, is flooding you with, flooding you with, uh, like a horde of of email and hate of de demanding that you know we have to get this game out for christmas and you know we hate all you all of you then do you push your do you push your employees to breaking point just to get the game out or do you kind of have the have the courage courage and the financial courage and the financial option of saying like you know we we won't get this out we have to we have to take care of the well-being of our employees really really tricky questions and how did we end up here? How did we get get into all of these problems? 
for example, we have a lot of limited perspectives. We don't always realize it. We, there are so many things that we haven't considered in terms of, of different gaming culture issues. Part of it is, is because it's been a, quite a narrow, narrow culture in terms of diversity, mostly you know, white, white guys in their 20s, 30s. This isn't the, the explanation to everything, but it is a big part of it. There, then there's, there's market realities. When we need to do or make decisions, difficult decisions between profit and ethical conduct, uh, I would assume that that profit often takes precedence, especially if, especially if you know taking a more ethical approach is uh, expensive or tricky or does not offer any safe or like any safe profit kind of this sort of this sort of thing. It's not always very profitable to be ethical, unfortunately. Uh, and this this is something that needs to be tackled. But of course, this is a huge structural problem in the whole world, and kind of a uh, element of the economic system that we're stuck with. The gaming industry and the game and gaming cultures in general have a long history of defending against moral panic. So every every time criticism is brought up, there is at least a section of people who get this kind of hackles up reaction. Uh, again, you know, it's again games being blamed blamed for everything. And sometimes it is this. Sometimes the the claims are unfounded. Sometimes they are unfair, but it doesn't. It shouldn't mean that we are. That it means that we don't address any issues. We have to address those issues that are actual issues. And then the uncritical views of our own understanding. We think that we know it all, but quite often we don't. Uh, and again, coming back to the fact that we are humans and we are fallible. So. Moving towards the end of the lecture, the, if we want to sol solve these problems, we need vision. We need to have some sort of idea of what kind of gaming cultures we want to see. We, we need to have some sort of well, like, like guiding light or at least a kind of like an idea, whether it's like I, I want to see non-toxic environments or I want our games communities to be very safe for everyone participating. Uh, I, want, I want to be able to sleep at night I, I want to be able to think that my game is making the world better. Uh, and when we have this kind of idea of the kind of cultures we want to see, are we doing something to reach that? And why are we doing that? And why are we not doing that? Again, this isn't to guilt anyone, but this is like for genuine con consideration. Is it maybe because there are, there are things that you haven't thought of? Are, are these things too expensive? Don't you know who to turn to or, or whatever? Uh, there are many reasons uh why we don't do good things and you know not doing good things does not necess necessarily make you a bad person is there something you could do better if uh there usually is and you know changing your opinions changing your conduct your behavior there's nothing bad in it it's called learning <laughs> progressing growing as a person building kind of approach uh what should you know more about what are you like try to identify the things that you are not very aware of. For me, for example, I know a lot of, lot of things about, about players. I know a lot of things about research and gaming. I know much less about the industry. Uh, and there are parts of uh, like big sec sections of gaming communities that I have very little knowledge on. I've always been a PC gamer. I know absolutely nothing about mobile games. I sometimes have to actively struggle in order not to see mobile games as inferior to PC games, because that's just the sort of ideas that I have, I have um, picked up from the culture. And it's a conscious struggle not to think like this. And luckily we have people who are doing good work dispelling these kind of ideas. And you know, if, if it's not us as gaming culture actors, activists, industry people, researchers, if we are not changing gaming culture for the better, then who is? then whose job is it, if, if not ours? Um, obviously, I think the answer is that it is our job. We have the, we have the knowledge, we, have the, we are the specialists, so it's, it's us who have to act. But of course, I don't want to end up on a too depressing note. There's, there's of course, hope. Uh, there are plenty of wonderful things in gaming culture, although today I've talked about the negatives. There are always there are always more positives in gaming culture than there are negatives. I'm fairly confident of that, even on my most pessimistic days. Uh, if we want to, we can change things. No, 
humanity has dealt with much, much bigger things in in the world. We have gotten rid of, you know, if we have gotten rid of slavery, then I'm pretty sure that we can we can deal with toxicity in gaming culture. It's it's more a question of whether we want to get the set the wheels in motion, whether we want to do the work. Uh, and I think there is there is a lot of potential there. We have seen seen nasty stuff throughout the years, but we have also seen some very positive retaliation. We have seen initiatives. We have seen people striving for better. And we don't have to solve everything, especially not at once. But we can start with something. And the most important thing is that we don't, you know, settle for nothing. Just, you know, do your own little bit. Maybe change again, change the world a little bit into something better. And gaming cultures, they're not immutable. They're constantly evolving, and we can try and guide the direction uh, in which they are evolving. Evolving. It's not something that is detached from us. And finally, I think it's it's very much okay to be idealistic. Uh, often, you know, cynicism and sarcasm and irony are the are the ways to go. But I would like to remember remind everyone that idealistic does not mean that you know you're naive, that you're stupid, or that you're out of touch. You have to acknowledge the realities of the world if if you want to change them. But this doesn't preclude you from you know striving for something better. So you know, if we want to build a better world. In this case, if we want to build better, more sustainable, more healthy gaming cultures, then we need ideals. Then we need to strive for something, because if we don't have ideals, then you know what are we going for? Thank you. Thank you, Miko, so much for for your presentation. Uh, let me get us to the discussion mode for for some questions and answers. So. Well, wow, that was a lot to think of and uh, kind of a very much of a Monday topic, I would say. <laughs> Maybe um, we are kind of learning uh, currently that games have evolved to be a place for, for so much kind of wide variety of human beings and human doings. And it takes a bit of time to get on that track since we've been kind of used to be, be the escapistic uh, realm of of entertainment or realm of uh, communities you a little bit uh, shed a light for for this question but i would like you to a bit more explore that how did you how did you got into this topic yourself like how did you like you've been doing this for years and years but what was it like did you just end up with the topic because of the uh, work that was uh, uh, kind of coming to your way or how did uh, how did you actually uh, end up with this topic so far that you did a PhD dissertation? And you constantly teach others like us with the topic. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Uh, for me, it was a kind of a com combination of coming from a like a gaming background myself, and then having to confront these confront these uh, conflicting ideals and sort of sort them together, and at the same time working with parents to try and get them to understand different facets of gaming culture. And at some point I just felt that, oh, you know, gaming gaming is actually really, really complicated. Uh, and, you know, what do we mean when we talk about that where we understand games and gaming? What is their worth understanding and and so on? And of course, you know, if I'm giving advice, for example, to parents uh, or professionals, like how should you address gaming, then I should have some idea behind it that what are we trying to get at? You know, if we are like parenting, for example, what should the goal of, of parenting regarding gaming be? What should parents strive for? Uh, and and so on and so on. Uh, plenty of things to unpack here in gaming gaming culture and and uh, and negotiating these conflicting truths and these conflicting views. Of course, you know, I I love gaming culture and I hate gaming culture. Uh, and this is a very tricky position. There are so many things that I like like about it so much. It's been like my favorite hobby for years and years and years, and it's probably always going to be. And at the same time, there are there are so many things about it that I don't like. So I can't just say blanket like do a blanket statement that I hate or love gaming culture. Um, I I have to sort of try and unpack what are the things that that I don't like and what are the things I like and. Sort of this understanding, this complexity has also helped me deal with the situation. Uh, 
I have realized that you know I don't have to condemn or love uncondi- unconditionally all of gaming culture. I can very well just you know not like some bits of it. Uh, usually, I use the use the allegory that I compare it to to football. I, I love football, like or soccer, <laughs> the <laughs> the European version of football, and um, and I, I love it. I absolutely love it. But of course, there are things in in football culture that I don't love. I don't like you know extreme right wing nationalist ultra hooligans. I don't like racist racist behavior in the crowds. I don't like the corruption of of FIFA or something like this. But it's you know I can love football and not like these parts. Um, so, but but sometimes it feels like it's just very very difficult to understand this kind of very simple idea that you don't have to love everything about something. You can you cannot like parts of it. When did you? When was your first job with games? Like, did, when when did your game expert career start? It. Uh, I think I. Hmm. I, I started studying games for my masters in 2011, and I think in 2012 I. 2012, I, I went to went to work with Ehud, so yeah. it's been, it's been ten years. Soon. Yeah, that's that's. There's been a lot happening, within this. Like, kind of feels very short time, but it, it's been a quite a lot of involvement during this time. By the way, sometimes you seem to go green with the screen. We don't know what what's going on, but I have I have I have heard <laughs> about this. This is there is this. There is this mysteri- mysterious greenness that I have actually had colleagues send me screenshots of it. I have oh. no idea. I, n- I never see any flashes of green, but, you know, everything is, is fine. I'm yeah. not a good at So Solip, do you have some questions on your own or would you like to give uh, Mikko something to chew on from the audience? Right. So this is this question is actually from our audience just now on this Twitch chat, but it also aligns with the question that I had. So it's a good chance, like double win win. The question is about Gamers Gate. So what do you see the legacy of Games Gamergate? Um, there were ranging between shading light on toxicity in games versus back, uh, backslash against political correctness. So it's a huge topic, I know it. But what's your thought on this? Um, this yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Obviously, there's there's a lot that goes into into that that topic. Uh, for one, it it really forced gaming culture culture and gaming culture actors to to react. It it became so huge that it it couldn't be ignored. So, like for all the all the bad stuff that it brought, uh, all the all the harassment, all the toxicity. All, all the really, really nasty, nasty stuff. Uh, but it it did sort of bring it to light. Uh, it it couldn't be ignored once it got that big. It it came up in the in the in the public discourse as well. It it reached media outside of gaming media quite quite well. It's a lot of people still know know what what you know Gamergate sort of is about. But of course, it ties into a much broader discussion well i don't think if if culture war is the is the proper term for it but it's there is this big development in in society uh with uh, with progressive ideals social justice feminism uh challenging these structures in previously quite uh this in these domains that have been used to kind of like being their own closed bubbles and then all of, all of a sudden we we are seeing that people are speaking out people who have always been there they're not just again it's not people coming from outside of gaming culture it's people inside gaming culture starting to speak out about these things and i think there's been a lot of things you know building up throughout the years and then once the kind of floodgates are open then it's it sort of explodes uh but yeah it's a it's a big it's a big struggle uh there are Lots of lots of issues there to to discuss. Gaming, gaming and gamer identity are are really tricky. Uh, people are feeling are feeling uh, threatened. There are people who don't want to identify as gamers uh, on on the on in these in these debates. Uh, and throughout all of this, we have these big changes in society at large. So you cannot really separate gamergate. From from everything else that is going on, you can draw like direct 
direct or at least weird, really weird squiggly lines, probably from you know Gamergate to QAnon and things like this. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very 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 difficult to to address. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, there was a nice comment or interesting comment in the chat uh, while you were uh, doing your talk that somebody didn't want to get into or hasn't got into multiplayer games, online multiplayer games because they're afraid of being bullied or harassed. Mm -hmm. And I can kind of relate to that. I've been playing some some online games, but I don't really want to introduce a lot of hostility to my own <laughs> entertainment, so to speak. Um, so I think that that is already a good kind of a point for developers that if if the whole image of the game um, uh, the games being quite negative experiences to some people or the image of uh, game cultures is this way they need to do a lot of work to make sure that uh, there is this audience of players that would like to try a game but they don't want to so. I don't know if you have any pointers to that, like how to advertise your own product that you take care of the community as well. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's that's really interesting. Um, one kind of I think sort of a, a hand wave reaction from I've sometimes seen from from industry actors uh, is is that you know of course we take care of our of our player base because uh, because having a toxic player base is bad for business. Mm. And and that then it on the surface that sounds like like yeah sounds sounds kind of legit but I don't know League of Legends has you know a legendarily toxic player base and it's super huge it's it's massively huge as a game uh, so apparently you know they're not all that bothered <laughs> so mm -hmm. so so this this kind of like a, like obviously we will do this and obviously we will do that because it's good for the business then uh, it's a it's a really simple answer but i do like the kind of positive approach uh, i'd be really happy for example of course i'm really stuck in my ways i only play csgo basically and and that has a fair bit of toxicity in them you know but you know if someone were to introduce a game that had uh like a way that if they could somehow ensure that you can have uh, like a safe and pleasant, safe and pleasant online gaming experience, uh, surrounded by a, even a somewhat healthy community. Then that I think that that could be that could be a, a selling point. Uh, I I know that for example, you know, in in Overwatch they have put a lot of work into representation in the game, for example. But of course they they still haven't been able able to address all the all the other toxicity introduced by the mm -hmm. players and in some ways this is of course probably always going to be to an extent an impossible task because you know people will be people uh, and of course you can go with the, down the route of you know just having a huge team of moderators and just you know wielding the ban hammer at, at every single infraction uh, and it, it, it might work but it, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a lot of work and, and I'm kind of uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it, if that's like a sustainable solution to the problem. It, it's not going to change the culture. It, it will make it's kind of like putting a huge bouncer at the door of your bar to make sure that no nasty people come in. <laughs> but I'm not sure if if that's like really the really the way to probably solve it. It's it's just addressing the outcomes, not the really not the, not the reasons. Mm. There, there was a, also a chat about a couple of the questions are addressing like how do you actually research on games and I think that this is also almost impossible to for a for a small developer for instance to get your message through that we are very much looking at look, taking care of our community and the play experience with other people even though you would find the ways to do that there wouldn't necessarily be ways to advertise this since there's so much game noise so to speak these days. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you if you have any tips for the people that would like to search for games for their kids or the games for themselves. Like, how do you actually, how do we get the information about what is the experience in the end? Uh, or do we just have to dive into the deep end and, and kind of just look wherever we can? There was, yeah. I also want to add a one question on top of that. Uh, there was also questions about where the game developers can also find certain those information, the tools, maybe they, they could help them to uh, redesign some of their toxic behaviors that yeah. could be implemented. 
Yeah, uh, on on finding games that that have, for example, like good good mechanics and, and communities, uh, I would I would turn to to these uh, these sort of entities, NGOs, uh, the media education people, for example. There are there are a lot of people uh, and NGOs who are who are you know making making lists of games based on on content, for example. There's bloggers, other content creators who are uh, who are recommending games. There are there are there are communities that are actively discussing, you know, which games have good communities, which games have bad communities. But of course, it's it's still going to be a lot of lot of guesswork. Um, I, I think there... that Biko, can I help you with one tip that I just recently said in an interview? Is that at least in Finland we are beginning to have a really great network of experts available in libraries. So would you recommend oh, yeah. that? Yeah, for for sure. We libraries are are great for media and game education. And I, with game education, I'm talking about game parenting, not as much development education. Uh, it's it's really good. Finland Finland has uh, a lot of people who are doing groundbreaking work in uh, like using gaming in youth work, for example, or educating people on 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 games, tackling games as as culture. Uh, if you are if you are on Facebook, then the group Peli Kasvattajien Verkosto is is quite good. has a lot has like over two thousand uh, experts who are interested in in games from the point of view of of not just education, not just kind of like game based learning, but more of of how to deal with issues of of gaming culture. Mm. Uh, we have all these uh, these different initiatives in in youth work. For example, uh, the city of Helsinki has Non Toxic, which is tackling Toxic behavior uh, in in competitive gaming. Uh, we have we have the Finnish Esports Federation, who has their own uh, ethical code of conduct and and so on. And of course, we have this this uh, bigger, older, uh, older NGOs such as like uh, MLL or Save the Children, who also have their own media education departments, who are who are good, you know, even just for consultation and just you know. Looking into their material, looking at the at the questions that parents are asking, uh, what are parents considering, for example, that are the are the issues? What are children considering that are the big issues? Uh, but it's it's also like a case of reaching out rather than just you know waiting for someone to come to you, uh, being being proactive, uh, and of of course like just talking to as many people from as diverse as like broad range of fields as you can. Mm, I think it's like just surprising us now that wow oh oh there are actually organizations and and within organizations there are also game uh, experts in so that has also moved really fast uh, at least in Finland I don't know other countries like I don't know if Mikko you know how exceptional we are in 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 Finland or in the Nordic countries with this case but but to uh, let, yeah, I, let I us think... know. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that Finland that Finland is is like uh, is based on my experiences at least. That Finland is quite far compared to to many countries when it comes to uh, to like game culture education and and addressing these sorts of things and bring, bringing games to libraries and uh, youth work and so on. So definitely, think many lessons to learn from Finland. But would, would, uh, and, would the developers be also available to reach out to these experts that know about? And on their field, also other forms of entertainment or arts uh, than games. I'm oh, sorry. Could you could you repeat repeat that? W- would it also be the developers that could reach to these same parties than, for instance, parents or us consumers, uh, with, with the same kind of concerns how to how to make their games or how to find games that would be um, suitable for uh, better societies? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for for sure. That, like that's that's what I would definitely. Uh, advice you know <laughs> developers to do uh, developers are also parents yeah they yeah that's and, and this is again you know the like the over like the overlapping roles you know developers mm-hmm. are parents developers are also also game players parents are game players so instead of just thinking about these as like really separate spheres uh we should like utilize this uh, this kind of over overlap a little more uh, and of course just you know this this open open discussion and having you know having an ear out and listening to what people are what people are saying you know if if you are if you run into discussions 
discussions on online where parents are saying like, oh, you know, our kid loves this game, but it's it's horrible because they're always harassed and it's your game that they're talking about, then, you know, alarm bell should start start ringing <laughs> somewhere. And and of course, you know, I, I think in, in Finland, the situation is is quite good uh, from what I what I know of, of you know, fin, Finnish of the Finnish industry, the people I've, I've talked to, uh, we seem to be quite doing quite well in the responsibility department. But there's, of course, you know, there's always always things to do do better as well, uh, and and there there are of course there are also like uh, there are value questions. Where do we want to want to like put money in? Uh, is it is it just you know that someone is taking care of the responsibility issues as uh, as kind of like on the side? Uh, is is accessibility like how are how is the company treating accessibility? Is it just you know something that someone googles for? For a moment, or listens to a lecture, or are, are we actually contacting a specialist in ac- accessibility issues and having them like paying them for consultation or something dramatic as that? So, <laughs> so, so what what sort of things are we viewing as viewing as important? Uh, do we want to put in mechan- mechanics, you know, for for assisting with controlling gaming behavior, or do we want to invest the same amount of time and money into you know creating two more levels? Uh, lots of lots of tricky tricky issues there. Mika, do you know how the age limits are done with games? Can you kind of provide us some details about that? Because that's one of the Finland. very 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 kind of a uh, established uh, way of getting information if your game is suitable to someone. Yeah. So uh, in all the all the games sold in Finland, I think at, at least the ones that are that are sold in in physical stores need to have a, an, a Peggy age, age limit. And it, it goes through uh, to the uh, process of, of evaluation. There is certain criteria, and the, the game is given an age rating based on those. Uh, it, it's usually a, a fairly fairly good outline of what the game contains and how kind of like uh, how intense the game's content is. So, for example, uh, like Angry Birds, Angry Birds has violence in it. You know, it's the, the birds are flying into the pigs. But it's a it's a Peggy three game. It's the lowest rating, so this means that the violence isn't very serious. It's it's cartoony and it's not scary violence. Whereas the violence in a Peggy eighteen game is it can be like you know sadistic or very realistic or or like uh, like very gory. Mm. This kind of this kind of thing. But of course it's a it's a mechanical system. Uh, it I if I if I recall correctly, getting your game rated does does cost something. Um, and of course, there are there are problems in the mechanical system. Your game may end up with a with a higher than usual rating because of some because of some mechanical issue. You know, a uh, classic example is is I think Sing Star used to have a Peggy 12 rating because one of the songs had swearing, mm-hmm. so that o- automatically pushed up the rating. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah. But of course, you know, parents parents do look at game at, at age ratings and content ratings. Just so and that that's usually the first thing that they that they check out if they're considering a new game, and and uh, the ratings are set from a kind of like a protect, child protection point of point of view. So that's I think a very very simple basic step towards like respons- responsibly marketing your game. Hmm. So do we have some questions from the from the students or from the audience today that you would like to kind of put on the table right now? Yeah, so it could be one of the last one. I also have my own question, by the way. Would it be enough time for that? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, so we talked about the age rating at the moment, and so that was the topic that was before. Um, so Finland is also becoming a very multicultural society. We have a lot of immigrants coming in, com- people coming from a different cultural background, and the rating is currently focusing on what is good for the children's, what is not good for the children's from the local Finland aspect. Do you think once the society becomes grow bigger and multicultural here in Finland, do you think that rating system might get affected also, or maybe we considered depending on how people interpret it, what is good for the kids or not? Yeah, it's a, it's a good, good question. Again, a really tricky question. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, I think currently, currently the, the system is quite it's quite easy to understand it's quite uh well it's it's of course you know it's it's pan-european it's used in a 
in a lot of countries, many of which are are more diverse than Finland is. Uh, I do think that we we will it will need to be be tweaked in in many ways. It will need to be changed. Uh, we need to consider like what does what does something like uh, like harassment or discrimination as a content mean, for example. Mm. Uh, and of course, the a lot of the risks nowadays or the what things that parents are consider, concerned about aren't necessarily maybe about game content so much. And it's a it's a content evaluation system. But you know, even if you have a really nice, friendly game with with very uh, like suitable for content suitable for children, uh, but it, it has an online like communication feature, mm-hmm. then you know how do you how do you rate that? Uh, I think that's something that will get that will get more detail into it. Like you know, mm-hmm. is there is there an option to to uh, communicate uh, communicate with with others? Like, like, um, can can anyone just send you a message, or do do they need your consent, for example, to con- contact you using voice or chat? And this kind, of, I think we will we will get hopefully more accurate information for for parents. Uh, it's really interesting to think that like, how will diversity be be affecting that? Uh, will we be reinterpreting the criteria, for example? And I think like discrimination is the is the main main thing here. Uh, will will our social norms be reconsidered on on in terms of like what, what for example counts as sexual content content or and how intense is it or or violent content content and so on? Thanks, that's great. And then I can move to the next question, which came from one of the students before the lecture came in. And then I think it's also a very good closing question that we can take um, because we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, the question is, what uh, can mitigating bullying and toxic behaviors in games could teach us about how to prevent similar phenomena in real life? So why this uh, sustainable game culture important and what can it teach us to make a sustainable culture? That's a, that's a really nice question. Uh, gaming culture is culture. Uh, life online is is you know it's it's real life, um, as we know all know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you know we are uh, humans. If if it if it wasn't if it wasn't clear before before COVID nineteen, then you know it should be clear by now that that our like our online and offline are very very closely intertwined, uh, and you know maybe if you learn to be a nicer person online, if you if you can uh, if you can can maybe you know stand up to bullying. If you can support someone who is who is encountering bullying online, then maybe you will be more encouraged to do that offline as well. And in a practical sense, it also means that, uh, of course, we have been dealing with bullying long before we started dealing with online bullying and online harassment. So there are there are lots of good uh, good things to pick up from offline offline efforts, for example. Uh, my favorite one is there was this. Uh, this campaign by the by the Finnish uh, Organization for Human Rights uh, on on how to prevent harassment and discrimination in public transport and one of the and one of the advice that they gave was you know if you don't even if you don't want to kind of uh, engage with the person who is doing the harassment and the person who is acting aggressively or you know being racist or or anything then you know you don't have to stand up to them. But you know you can go and you can go and and you know give your support to the person who is being targeted. You can go and you can go and sit next to them, uh, and kind of just show that you are here. Uh, and you know, if if you don't want to pick a fight with someone on the bus, then you know you can focus on the person who is being targeted. And this is something uh, something that I have been talking about, especially to young gamers, for example, that if you encounter this kind of stuff online, then I don't know. I think most of us will find it very difficult, you know, in the middle of a game to start standing up to someone who is being toxic. It's much easier, of course, just to, you know, put them on mute or, you know, vote ban them or something. But it can be also very important just to sort of show your support to the person who is being who is being attacked. Um, like one of my favorite favorite experiences ever in online gaming, and I and this is this. You know, I was talking about we need to have hope. Uh, I was I was just learning to play Counter Strike uh, many many years ago, 
and I was I really really messed up in a game. Uh, it, it was horrible. I had played the game for maybe you know twenty hours or so, and I was I was really bad at it. And we our team would have won the round, but I couldn't find the bomb and defuse it. Oh. It's all all I all I needed to do, and I failed at it. And of course, you know you get the usual usual name calling in the chat and you know they're going oh you know you noob and you know get the, get the hell out of here and you know uninstall the game and you're terrible and then and then someone speaks up and, and goes like oh you know why, why are you calling him a noob you know when when you start out and you're a noob when i start i'm a noob you know everyone is noob at first and it's okay he'll learn mm-hmm. and i was so happy and this this kind of like like made made me feel that you know as long as we remember that that we're still like people people online uh, as long as we do challenge these sort of toxic ways of behaving that we do sometimes just out of habit, then there is still, you know, there is a possibility to t- turn things for the better. Yeah. That was beautifully said. I do want to still ask because there were more people than one in the chat that uh, wanted you to a bit more give a light on your own development as being a bit toxic in, mm. in games culture. So is this story part of that development? Was it someone that really rescued from from the future toxic Mikko or how did it happen? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. Uh, like like many like many middle aged guys, I used to be a young guy. Uh, <laughs> and, and and you know and back when back when you are a young guy it's it's quite uh, you know, I I can very easily recognize myself from a lot of the a lot of the, like the negative representations. Uh, you know, me and my me and my friends would go, oh, you know, it's again, it's the feminists again. You know, being being and like like spoiling all the fun and you know, uh, they they don't know mm-hmm. anything about gaming and they don't know anything about movies or comics or geek culture. And you know, I was the well, I'm I'm not gonna say that I was the worst. Uh, <laughs> we never we never did go over, like for like super hostile harassment, but I definitely I re- I recognized the ways of the ways of thinking. Mm-hmm. Like everyone who disagreed with us. Uh, we we just assume that you know they know less about this stuff than us and of course like oh you know they are ideological we are neutral we are objective like <laughs> yeah. we don't have like any ideologies like yeah. uh, this, this kind of like uh, assumed neutrality when in fact we just you know didn't realize our own ideologies uh, <laughs> we are not ideological we are anti-feminist and that's different uh, so. <laughs> but but then you know uh, I think well as as was mentioned that you know these these things tie tie up together with with the rest of life and of course you know at some point you you grow as a person uh when you're in in your 30s you hopefully think differently than when you are in your in your early 20s uh you mature you start to understand that that life is maybe a little bit more complex than you thought at first uh you spend time with 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 the right people who give you Give you better ideas and alternative views of the of the world and this kind of this kind of thing. Uh, I've always been lucky enough to have like a very very uh, like a group of a group of friends who are like uh, how do I how do I put put this uh, quite open open minded, not very hostile, not very toxic. So it's it's not really uh, like an environment that I had to struggle out of. Uh, so I got got off quite easily. Uh, out of out of that, but it's I think it's also helped me understand some of the some of the issues around gaming culture. Uh, when I was I was watching the whole Gamergate thing unfold, then it, it was quite easy for me to, for example, to understand like why are these young guys acting like they are because I could recognize the sentiment that they were they were bringing out. Uh, and I do believe that it's it's important to be able to empathize to some point. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that you are that you are you know accepting. It doesn't mean that you are that you are agreeing or that that you are letting like this toxic behavior slide. But it does help to understand like what are the things that are driving people people in this in these discussions. So I try to look at look at things from multiple points of view, but still choose the one that I believe to be you know <laughs> right. But not, it's it's never right. But I but what I believe that will lead to the best best results. So there is hope, at least when people grow up. Hopefully, they will not be toxic yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, if if there if there wasn't hope, then you know, why why would we why would we raise children? Why would we bother educating mm. everyone? So, I I I do like like talking about idealism because we we do need to have 
this positive outlook on on life and this sort of realistic optimism uh because you know if if we don't then why bother with anything yeah uh, if, if we're just also I think it's also aligned with your statement about building of why we have to mm. consider it. So we have to grow up, cultivate ourselves to become a better gamers, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like think think twice, be critical about what you've been doing and what others have been doing and what it looks like it might be a fact, but it's not. So like think critically, build on yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That was a great end note, Soliv. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, Miko, for your presence today and your wise words. Um, I'm sure I, I should also get... rethink yeah. of myself some of the toxic chat that I did just last night. Oh, no. I am very sorry for all those players. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but, but actually, it's it's very nice, Soliv, that you that you brought it up because I, I think it's also really healthy to remind, remind ourselves that, you know, that we are like none of us is perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, I I talk about I talk about you know behaving behaving online and 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 sort of and, and you know educate young gamers on how you should act, should act online. Uh, and it's it's still you know if I'm playing something, I have to you know grit my teeth and you know squeeze my <laughs> mouth just so I don't you know start flaming in the chat or something. Uh, but it's you know, but I think that that's progress. At least you sort of notice that okay now I'm about to be mm -hmm. toxic so you know maybe i should you know have a glass of water <laughs> or you can apologize also like that some some of the things that you're just accountable of your own actions that but that's yeah that's that's, that's true and it's, hopeless in that sense too yeah it's okay to develop another mm. lovely counter-strike experience was that i i completely you know i had i surprised an, an opponent uh you know i walked up on them and then proceeded you know to empty my whole gun uh completely missing them you know from two meters away or something like this uh they turn around and shot me in the face uh, and then sorry and then you know wrote in the chat something like ha 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 you know learn to you know learn to shoot asshole uh and i replied in the chat like like you know that was that was just that was just nasty and i put a put a sad face in there and you know a moment later they they write me back oh well you know i'm sorry maybe try a different gun <laughs> oh, productive right there. So it's, a bit it's, of it's, more it's, progress, it's, yes. It's these small touches of humanity that we bring in there, because of course mm. online it's very easy to, you know, it's it's just nicknames, nicknames on the screen. Like I still, you know, I, I play Counter Strike. I go and I play a few rounds of deathmatch and things like this. I, and I always try to remember, you know, at the start of every game, you know, I, I go, you know, good luck, have fun, mm. and you know, after every game, just go, you know, GG, even if no one else is doing it just to sort of remind remind them that you know that we are we are people mm. good thank you so much you let's much. end the session today on this note and i'm sure that if you want to ask more questions from mikko he would be happy to reply uh you can find mikko in best in where yep uh twitter is very good at mv merilainen or you know, email mikko.merilainen at tuni.fi. So that's T-U-N-I dot F-I. And make sure that you also follow our own uh, social media channels. Maybe we can highlight some of the Mikko's tweets on our Twitter as well. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Solid. Thank you, Mikko. And thank you for everyone in the, in the stream chat uh, commenting and asking questions. See you next time. And this is Games Now. I'm Anna Casa Kultima. And hope to see you again. Have a nice week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah.